So this video is going to think about a further aspect of plasmid design, which is to think about promoters, which are the kind of switch regions in front of a gene. So there's a whole other video on the basics of plasmid design, but I'll just recap that quickly. So if we've got a plasmid that we're using uh, to clone our gene and express it in a particular cell type, then we've usually got the following features. So if we draw the plasmid out, um, so, so my other video explains this. So there's an origin of replication, which allows the plasmid to be copied. You might have, for example, uh, a selectable marker gene. So that might be something uh, like an antibiotic resistance gene. Um, and then you might have a multiple cloning site. And there's whole other videos on how uh, those are used in cloning. Uh, so that's our basic plasmid. And then we put our uh, multiple, uh, we put our gene into the multiple cloning site uh, via uh, restriction cloning, for example. Okay. Um, and on the diagrams, I've got um, these little arrows here. So this arrow equals the promoter, which is the kind of, uh, it's the regulatory region for a gene. So the sequence of the promoter determines whether that gene um, is going to be able to be switched on or off. Okay, so that's what those little arrows mean on my diagram there. Um, and this can be quite important when you're cloning. So for example, if I clone my gene into this multiple cloning site, I'll just show that bit, the plasmid. So I've got promoter there, and then you choose your restriction sites so that your gene of interest uh, went into your um vector such that so there's the promoter so that's going to uh, determine uh whether it's going to be transcribed or not so promoters work at the level of transcription so you'd have your gene of interest there uh you've had you'd have your atg start code on at the beginning you'd have your stop code on at the end and that promoter would determine that that gene was able to be switched on or off okay so we need to be able to think about what promoters we're going to put into our vectors um, to get the right expression patterns that we need. And in order to understand this, we need to think a little bit about how transcription is regulated in both bacteria and eukaryotes. So let's start with the bacteria. OK, so the way that this works in bacteria, let's draw out uh, the promoter region of a gene. OK, so I'm just going to draw it here. And here we've got plus one uh, is the transcription or start site. And the ATG, uh, which is the translational start site, will be somewhere downstream of that plus one site. Okay. So what does a promoter look like in a bacterium? Well, there's two important uh, elements in a bacterial promoter. So one is what we call the minus 10 site. Okay, so we have between five to eight base pairs between the start site and this element. Um, and we have what's called the minus 10 site. Um, and that has a typical sequence, uh, which is called a consensus sequence uh, of T, A, T, A, A, T uh, is the consensus sequence. So that means that the majority of genes would have that specific sequence at the minus 10 site. So it doesn't matter what the sequence is between the minus 10 and the plus 1. We can have any bases we like, but at minus 10, uh, we expect to say T, A, T, A, A, T. Okay. There's then another element uh, a little bit further upstream at what we call the minus 35 site. So you've got 16 to 18 base pairs in there. And that minus 35 site also has a consensus sequence, so T, T, G, A, C, A. Okay. So with our consensus sequence, uh, what we tend to find is if you are very similar to the consensus, then you are a strong promoter. So you're likely to have high levels of expression. Uh, the more sequence differs from the consensus is likely to give you a weaker promoter. 
Okay, so if you want to have really strong expression, then you'd want to have exactly these consensus sequences in your promoter. Okay, so the way that these work um, is that bacteria, uh, so we obviously need to have an RNA polymerase come on, come along, which is going to transcribe our gene. So in bacteria, uh, the polymerase is made up of four subunits. Uh, we have an alpha, an alpha, a beta, and a beta prime. Uh, is the uh, core RNA polymerase. Okay. Um, so that polymerase is the one that's going to actually transcribe your gene, is going to make the new molecule of RNA, but that um, core polymerase can't actually recognise these sites. Okay, The polymerase doesn't know where to start transcribing from. The thing that will recognise it um, is what we call a sigma factor. Um, so the coronary RNA polymerase uh, makes the RNA. Okay. The sigma factor is for recognition and is involved in the initiation of transcription. So what happens um, is that this whole complex actually moves, so it kind of binds somewhere random in the DNA, then moves along, and it's looking, the sigma factor is looking for this minus uh, 35 and minus 10 sites. When the sigma factor finds those two consensus sequences, so it's looking for a specific sequence, when it finds that consensus sequence, then uh, transcription will initiate, so then the, the sort of factors recombine. In fact, the sigma factor uh, dissociates uh, after initiation. So the sigma factor comes along, finds the consensus sequence, and then once that's sort of bound, that tells the polymerase to start transcribing, and it starts transcribing from the plus one site. Okay. There are multiple different sigma factors, um, but the usual one is sigma 70, uh, is the kind of basal one. Um, uh, is used in most uh, conditions. There are other sigma factors, so for example the sigma 32 uh, is a heat shock sigma factor, so if you um, change the temperature that your um, uh, bacteria are at, it will start using sigma factor 32 and they would have a different consensus sequence so these consensus sequences up here are the ones for sigma 70, the kind of you know, basic uh, sigma factor. So for bacterial um, promoters, we need to have a minus 10 element, which in most conditions will be TATAAT. We need to have a minus 35 element, TTGACA. We need to have the right spacing between them in order that transcription can initiate. So that's bacteria. Eukaryotes inevitably little bit more complicated because uh, bacteria have a single polymerase uh, eukaryotes have three different polymerases so RNA polymerase 1 uh, does ribosomal RNA RNA polymerase 2 does messenger RNA and RNA polymerase 3 uh, does transfer RNA uh, and uh, it, does the, it actually does the 5SR RNA and some other stuff as well um, so we're going to focus in on RNA polymerase 2, which is the one that's used for genes that get transcribed and translated. Uh, so it makes mRNA. Okay. Um, so an RNA polymerase 2 type promoter. So let's draw it out the same as we did before. Okay. So there's our plus one start site. Again, there'll be an ATG somewhere downstream of that. Okay. The main thing that we have in an RNA polymerase 2 promoter uh, is at the minus 25 site, we have something called the tartar box, which again has a consensus uh, sequence um, that it's, it's another lot, load of T's and A's and T's, uh, the tartar box. Okay. We then have some kind of upstream elements. Uh, which is a couple of diff different ones. You don't need to worry particularly about them. Okay? But what we can also have um, several kilobases away, I'm just going to draw this as a loop, Okay, is we can also have enhancers. Okay? 
Okay, so this might be several KB away in the natural genome. Okay, so the way that this works is like this. So we have um, in eukaryotes, initiation happens in a slightly different way. Um, so the first thing that would happen um, in a eukaryotic situation would be that you'd have, there's a trans, what's we call a basal transcription factor uh, for all RNA polymerase 2 genes. So it doesn't matter what gene it is, this one will come in. So the first thing that comes in uh, is something called uh, TF2D. Uh, so there's a specific protein comes in and binds the tartar box. There's then a whole other set of transcription factors, all basal transcription factors that you don't need to worry about. They come in and they bind to these upstream elements. And then what you might also have um, is to have some gene-specific transcription factors. So I'll show these in red. So gene-specific transcription factors would bind these enhancer elements, which are further upstream. And then once all of that has bound, so this sort of big complex, then you have the RNA polymerase 2 comes in, and then you get transcription uh, starting at the minor, at the plus one site. Okay, so eukaryotes is a bit more complicated. There's more upstream elements you need, and then you might have some upstream enhancers to give you gene-specific transcription factors. So they would control things like tissue-specific um, or uh, maybe environmental-specific regulation of genes. Okay, so we've got two quite different designs of promoters. So this, the important thing is that the sequences in a bacterial transcript um, promoter are different to the sequences in a eukaryotic one. The sequences are different, the spacings are different. So this means um, that those two types of, um, tran of promoter are effectively, uh, they're incompatible with each other. Okay. So you need to have the right type of promoter for what you're trying to do. So if you want your gene to be expressed in bacteria, in E. coli, it has to have a bacterial type promoter. So you have to put the right sequences in. If you want your gene to be expressed in a eukaryote, you need to have this type of promoter with a tartar box and your upstream elements. So you need to match um, your promoter to your system. Okay. So if we think about selectable markers, so if you want your uh, marker to be uh, expressed uh, in a bacterium, then you would need a bacterial promoter to get that expression system going. So if that's was you know, canamycin resistance, you need a bacterial promoter so that when this is expressed, uh, when this is put into a bacteria, then the bacteria can express it because it's got the right sort of promoter. But in some more complicated um, systems, you might have a second marker uh, that you would want to be expressed in your eukaryote. So you're trying to select, let's say, your yeast cells. If you're trying to select in yeast, yeast are eukaryotes, so you need a eukaryotic promoter. Okay, so you need to match the type of promoter to the type of system you've got. The other thing that you need to think about with promoters is there are actually three types uh, of promoters. So there are promoters which we call constitutive, uh, which is, means that they're expressed all the time. Okay, um, and we have these in both bacteria and eukaryotes. So let's just draw out a little table. Uh, so bacteria. And eukaryotes. Okay, so we have these constitutive promoters which are good if you want to have your genes switched on all the time. Okay, so for example, in bacteria, um, for example, there's a promoter called T7, um, which only works if you have uh, T7 polymerase in the genome. T 
T7 is, uh, it originally comes from bacteriophage, it originally comes from a virus, but there's plenty of E. coli strains that have been adapted to have T7 in the genome, for example. So T7 is an example of a bacterial promoter that's constitutive, it's switched on all the time. So that might be quite good uh, for expressing antibiotic resistance gene, for example. In eukaryotes, a couple of examples through for you. Um, so, for example, in plants... Uh, there's one called, it's called the cauliflower mosaic virus 35S promoter. Um, so that's switched on pretty strongly all the time. Uh, in mammals, if you're making a mammalian construct, there's another one that's derived from a virus uh, called CMV. So notice that these constitutive promoters, the ones we tend to use making plasmids, if we want things to be switched on really strongly all the time, we often use things that derived ultimately from viruses. All of these are viral derived promoters. Not all constitutive promoters are, but quite a lot of them are. Because what viruses are trying to do when they hijack a cell is they want to make sure that the viral proteins are made really strongly. They don't want to wait for particular environmental conditions. So actually these viral promoters are pretty good at driving constitutive expression of what's being switched on all the time. Another thing you might want to do is to have uh, inducible promoters. Okay, So these are switched on or off in particular uh, environmental conditions. So you might not want to have your gene switched on all the time. You might want to be able to switch it on and off uh, in a particular environment. Uh, so in bacteria, some examples of there would be uh, the, uh, the trip promoter uh, is repressed by the amino acid tryptophan. So you could control whether it was switched on or off, depending whether you've got tryptophan in your media. Uh, there's also one called ARA ABD, uh, which is induced by a rabinose. Uh, so that's another type of sugar. Uh, so again, you can control whether the gene is switched on or off, depending on your growth conditions. Okay, In eukaryotes, um, so you might have, again, a plant one. That uh, would be XVE, uh, which is induced by estradiol, which is estrogen. Okay, Plants don't usually make estrogen, so that's quite a good thing that you can synthetically control um, whether the gene switched on or off. You can also have uh, tetracycline. Uh, which again is, a, is an antibiotic, you wouldn't find it usually in a eukaryotic cell, so the TRE promoter would allow you to switch on and off with tetracycline. The other thing that you might want to have um, in, obviously not in a bacteria, uh, but in a eukaryote, would be to some, have something that was t tissue specific. So, for example, if you were trying to manipulate uh, fruit ripening, you would want a promoter um, like the uh, E8 promoter, uh, which is a tomato fruit specific promoter. You might not want the gene to be switched on in the roots, uh, you might only want it switched on in the fruit. So obviously bacteria, single cell, that's not less relevant, but if you're in a eukaryote you might want to have something that was tissue specific. Okay, So the important thing is that you have the right promoter for where you're trying to express your gene. So if you want to express it in a bacterium, you need a bacterial promoter. If you want to express it in a eukaryote, you need a eukaryotic promoter. And you've got a choice of different types of promoters. You can have constitutive, which is switched on all the time, inducible, which you can switch on or off in particular conditions, or you might even want a tissue specific one if you are working in a eukaryote. Okay, so uh, the main, the most important thing is you need to match the promoter to your expression system and uh, your gene specific requirements. Okay, so you need to match it to whether you're in bacteria or whether you're in eukaryotes. If it's eukaryotes, you need to match it to you in a plant or you in a mammal. And then you need to think about what your gene specific requirements. Do you want your gene switched on all the time or do you want your gene to be switched on or off in particular environmental conditions?